Today I'm having coffee with three of the ladies from Girls Who Conduct, an initiative dedicated to empowering and encouraging female, female identifying, and non-binary conductors. And now I'm going to make Coffee with the Maestro history by having my first multiple guest episode as I call up Michelle DeRusso, Hannah Knackman, and Chow Wen Ting. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Hey, <laughs> hey. This is an exciting um, coffee talk this morning because it's the first time ever I've had coffee with more than one person at a time. And so today, uh, I'll let the, each of you introduce yourselves, but uh, we've got the some of the ladies from Girls Who Conduct. <laughs> so Michelle, you you happen to be my top left uh, picture. So So who are you? <laughs> wow, that's a deep question for a morning coffee. <laughs> uh, my name is Michelle de Rosa, <laughs> and I'm originally from Argentina, currently in Washington, D.C., and I'm co-creator and instructor of Girls Who Conduct, so yeah. I'm happy to be here with my team, part of my team. Well, if you're from South America, you must know something about coffee. You know, yes and no. I mean, we love coffee and I have Italian roots. Um, so I am a huge fan of coffee and I have my coffee here, but we don't grow our own coffee. That's the only thing that I can say. We drink all the Colombian and Brazilian coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what kind of coffee are you drinking now? I'm a huge fan of Nespresso. I know I shouldn't. Um, pretty good it's pretty good. yeah so i'm drinking i usually drink cosi or voluto those are my favorites so kind of medium roast lightish yeah nice well it's a beautiful uh beautiful cup beautiful setup thank you it's my um, first and and then you said you live in washington dc and um and you and i met online a couple months ago and we were doing something another thing that chow Wen organized um we were doing um, Maestro's Professor together, or we met each other there. And um, and we both lived in DC for some time. Did you live there also about five or seven years ago when I lived there? Did we live at the same time? No, I wish. I moved here during the pandemic. So I've been here since June, more or less. And it's because my partner is in the military, which is another thing we have in common. Uh, different branch though, Navy. Ah. Uh, but yeah, so I haven't seen much of the real city. It's been a, a weird, you know, getting to know the places, coffee shops, a lot of them are closed. So I hope I can see the big grandeur of the city soon. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. It's a beautiful city, actually. It's really wonderful. Yeah. All right. Uh, Chow Wen, you're, you're on the bottom left, so I'll go with you next. And Chow Wen and I know each other a little bit. Uh, how are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me and our team of our team yep yeah so you're really entrepreneurial lately since the pandemic started you've started all these online groups and online classes and and um girls who conduct is is i think your newest one i don't know maybe there's more but um but i know you were doing <laughs> maestro as professor last year with carolyn watson and yes uh, and you had a lot of wonderful guests on and that was nice yeah that turned out to be really fun for the two of us so I think Silas and I met in New York City. I did one of the mm -hmm. workshops that he organized. So we met, it's probably, it shouldn't be too long ago, but it felt like past life. Now we are <laughs> <laughs> past. Yeah, was it the one with, was Diane Witchery the faculty on that one? Yes. Or, oh yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, I think it's maybe just two years or three years ago. Oh my gosh, it yeah. feels like much longer, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. I don't really, I don't even remember the full orchestra. Um, I think looking at the time, it was like exactly a, a year ago. And we haven't had, and I haven't had any orchestra conducting. Oh so, my gosh. But yeah, I'm really happy that there, there's a lot of things offered online. And I know like at the beginning, people were really bored. We we're staring at our computer all the time. So it started first with Caroline. And so Caroline and I met at Dallas Opera. We mm. were the fellows for the Hearts Institute for Women Conductors. And Michelle just went spiritually in Dallas for <laughs> two weeks. 
<laughs> because it was held online this year as well. So Caroline and I say we should start something. Everybody start something. We were like, okay, we need to do something. Otherwise, we'll be forgotten pretty soon. What's something that is not being talked about? There are so many connectors talking about or talking to the maestros, interview people. And we should say something that no one else is talking about. That's how we started um, the series of Maestro as Professor talking about collegiate orchestra conducting positions in many ways from how you apply for a position, how you navigate, how you talk to your um, boss and your colleagues, how do you negotiate and navigate all the things around it. And after that, we took a break and Caroline and I did a mini show for um, Conducting 101 this during Christmas because after Professor S. Maestro, a lot of people reach out to us saying, hey, we really want to start conducting, but we had no idea. And we had people sending us videos with no clue what a conductor's video was, should be like. Oh, yes. Like that was shot from their back, from and I even had a friend telling me that he was watching um, videos for the Matajish conducting competition. And there was one, so his job was to click on all the links to make sure the videos work. Yes. And there was one video that was shot at a, um, apparently a workshop. So that was the screen gesture and the conductor cut off. And the master teacher came up and say, good job, well done. And that was it. That was the submission <laughs> yeah. video that prompted us thinking and also as part of like girls who conduct because I, I was very fortunate I started conducting real groups since high school. I conducted my um, high school choir and string orchestra and we have a combined full orchestra with the boys high school nearby. But I know a lot of people didn't really have the luxury of like working with musicians since young and then being exposed to it. So that's a little bit of like how I had the idea of starting Girls Who Conduct. And it was so amazing that I have this wonderful team of colleagues. I've waited so long, I've waited years to really start and felt it was the right time with the right people. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, you're you're right about that. Um, is by the way, is Maestro as Professor finished, or will you keep doing it? We are kind of whenever we are free and bored from our real life, yeah. <laughs> and then we just chat and say, "Hey, we should do something," and then we start brainstorming and we figure out. She's busy. I think she got a couple of guest conducting um, lineups. So she said, I have piles of scores to study. And I said, I'm totally jealous. So I'm just not talking to her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but we're probably starting we're probably in, in, in around May. I'm not sure what. OK. Yeah, it's summertime is a good time for those classes. Uh, I'm on a search committee right now for a conducting position, and it's shocking. What the what the application materials look like. So the bad news for a lot of people is they have no idea what the application should look like, or they have a bad idea. And yeah. uh, and then the good news is for people with good uh, application materials is that your stuff floats to the top pretty easily, because if yeah. you get fifty or seventy or a hundred applications, half of them right away can just go away, because they don't they're not complete. And then you start looking at the videos and the quality of the materials, and then half of the remaining go away pretty quickly. And it gets down to a reasonable number, but I was shocked when I was watching the videos. And 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 I think some of the conductors are good, but no one ever told them how to put the camera or don't do this yeah. in your video. So I was yeah. thinking um, after after doing this search process, I thought I should have a workshop on how to apply for jobs because some people just don't know and they're never going to get a job until someone tells them. And I of yeah, course some, yeah. of course I'm not allowed to contact these applicants and tell them your application stunk because of this. No, no we'll just uh, get their email address and then send them the promotional materials from my stress <laughs> professor. Yeah. <laughs> Add them to our email list. Is that well, illegal? I, you know, I think some of the people, some of the things I've looked at recently could could use this some advice, but I don't know if it's technical <laughs> to 
um, take advantage of the list like that. But uh, and uh, another thing that is making history today is I think Chao Wen, you you have made the record for the farthest away guest because you are in China right now. I'm in Taiwan. Yeah. In Taiwan. Okay. And what what time of, of day is it there? And um, I need to check because I have my laptop set. So I don't confuse myself. What time zone? I believe it's it's Monday, eleven p.m. Oh, yeah, so we're so thirteen hours apart. Are you drinking coffee at eleven p.m.? Yes. Okay. Because I'm teaching orchestra right after this. <laughs> oh, right, because you're teaching. You're you're in Taiwan, but you're teaching in Georgia, the Correct. the U.S. state of Georgia, online. Yes. Okay, so does that mean you have to sleep all day and then stay up all night? No, I take naps because my kids go to local schools. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Incredible. Well, Hannah, nice to meet you. I um, have, we've never met before. And although I think we, we talked just briefly about how we almost crossed paths in, at the Manhattan School of Music yeah. there. But you, so you're still in New York City right now. I am. Yeah. So nice to meet you. I, I mean, this is so lovely. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still in New York City. Uh, I don't know if I'm interacting with the city, but I am here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have so many friends there and a lot of them are your friends too, but it seems like people are getting out and walking around and they're sort of in some way experiencing the city. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when, it, when it was a little warmer out, we did a lot of stuff or I guess... I can only really speak to my ensembles. I don't know what other people are up to, but um, we did a lot of stuff out in like the parks and like, cause I, I am mostly a choral vocalist person as we talked about. And so would coordinate some like sing-ins where everyone was spread out across, you know, under an arch in Central Park or that kind of thing. So it has been nice to be able to like get some air, but kind of like Chow and Michelle have said, like our ensembles are really just kind of stopped or virtual right now, which is, just nuts, but um, yeah, I I can't bring myself. I I was crazy enough to actually buy a place in the pandemic. I I'm not one of the people that fled the city. I took the opposite. You took uh, advantage of the low interest rates and probably <laughs> prices are stabilizing. I think. Yeah, no, I mean the market is it's great. <laughs> Just hoping it you know the city bounces back. It will. It absolutely will. Um, but yeah, I mean I I did the thing where I went out to you know the woods for a while and and tried to stay away from people because New York City was a scary place at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and then I just, I, I, I needed to be back where the action was the action as much as there is now during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I'm back here, mostly just teaching from my apartment and I'm hoping as soon as it gets warm out, we can start to do some of that outdoor distance stuff again. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think we're on the tail end of the pandemic and yes we have to see it through it'll be several more months probably but um it can't go on forever and now that the virus the vaccine is being distributed slowly but surely yeah i know i can't wait for travel i'm dying to travel again and um i'm still working with my university orchestra a little bit but it's but it's really impacted by the social distancing and the numbers are down and all that stuff so i just, I just want this thing to be over with so we can get back to it making music and a lot of people who are out of work can start working again. Definitely. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about uh, Girls Who Conduct. That's Hannah, a question do you want to start? Yeah, because Hannah is the latest who joined our, our team. She discovered us. So we'll <laughs> let her speak first to see what attracted her. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. Um, I feel like it was the luckiest day of my life when I stumbled upon Girls Who Conduct. Um, yes, basically, I mean, I'm sure others can attest to this, but, you know, with the pandemic, I sort of threw myself into my online presence. Um, and so I built an artist page and started connecting with so many artists, you know, either that I already knew or for the most part, I feel like it's kind of like we talked about Silas, where so many people that like I was running in these concentric circles with, I like actually started to connect with. And so a thing that kept being suggested on my feed was this girls who conduct thing. And I kept clicking on it and being like, this is so cool. Okay, next. And then it would show up again. And I, so finally I like 
decided I was like, no, I can't ignore this. This is something that like I've wanted to create myself. Uh, <laughs> and so I messaged them and I was like, I, I should preface this by saying that before I went to do my master's at, at a conservatory, I did the liberal arts thing at a women's college. I went to Bryn Mawr for undergrad. And so they like planted the seeds of a feminist, like deep, deep, deep inside of me. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, saw Girls Who Conduct and I messaged them and I was like, I, I have to get involved. Can you guys use an extra team member? And I think as fate had it, they were just looking for someone to add to the team so that we could have this, this great even number and we can co-teach and it, it works really beautifully. Um, and like on the first meeting, it was like, we'd, I, I hope I'm not speaking for you guys. At least for me, it felt like we'd known each other forever. <laughs> um, yeah, and then it kind of, it kind of, uh, went from there. So the program, I'm sure Chowen could speak to this even better as the, you know, the, the true founder. Right. Yeah, the brains of it all. I've never met someone more organized in my life. If I, you know, ever start yeah. a choir, he's going to be on my board. <laughs> now you know Chowen. Um, <laughs> but so, um, yeah, basically we're, we're a mentorship program uh, for young women, women identifying and non-binary folk. Um, and we just strive to provide a space for uh, young people to come talk in a, you know, at, this field is very male dominated. It's just how it is in the industry. And so we just had our first session uh, this past weekend and it was amazing. It was so inspiring. And the questions we got, at least uh, what I was hanging on to, were so many things that you wouldn't get in a normal conducting class. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. It wasn't just me that noticed that. So, I mean, we had the basics. We we broke out into breakout rooms. We talked about basic gesture. We talked about, you know, rehearsal etiquette, all the stuff you would get in a normal class for conducting. But then we had all of these beautiful additional layers that were very gender specific, um, like, you know, our physical bodies as women or, you know, what to do in X, Y, Z situation that you wouldn't necessarily get in a normal class. And I found that so amazing because, you know, I went through grad school and I had these questions in my mind and I, I didn't necessarily feel like it was the right time or place to ask them. Um, so yeah, so, so we're in the middle of our inaugural program. And I know Chowen has lots of other ideas on the, uh, the burners for what's to come next. Um, but it's been so, so inspiring. Um, I'm sure they can, they can fill in the gaps I'm missing so much because this, this program has so many facets to it, which is what makes it wonderful. You guys mentioned um, the applications and getting all these applications that you have to kind of table because they're not quite complete. Day one, Chowen was like, okay guys, or, sorry, we're changing our terminology. I need to fix that too. <laughs> okay, everyone, we need to talk about your applications. Some of these, you did not follow the directions. Let's get into the weeds of this and make sure you know what an application should look like right now. <laughs> um, and I just remembered like the girls were just like, oh, all right, here we go. But it's great. I wish I had someone do that for me when I was in high school. But yeah, yeah, I'm gonna toss the baton, no pun intended, to uh, Michelle and Chao Wen to speak more about the program. Yeah, what, what types of uh, classes or courses are on the website and how does a person sign up for them, et cetera? Me? Okay, <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> overstep. Um, yeah, I just want to say that it's really amazing how Chao Wen just put this group of women together to for this you know very specific purpose that I think we're all very passionate about. And our team, I think it's special because we all have our superpower in some way. You know, some are more orchestra uh, oriented, uh, opera or choral or music education. So I think that it completes, you know, all of our, 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 our areas that we need in order to provide a good service. So we started this Saturday and we're gonna have a couple of weeks of instructions every Saturday. And the girls basically can, there are electives so they can choose each Saturday what to focus on either score study or programming. And a lot of it depends on their level. We were talking about it with Chao Wen. Maybe some are more experienced and would like to learn about rehearsal techniques and others are more on the beginning stages of conducting and need um, basics on how to hold a baton or basic patterns or how to approach score study. So we've divided each, each, um, each member has taken over some of the topics and each Saturday we will 
uh, just focus on them and going to breakout rooms and yeah, I don't know if Chawan, if you want to say anything else, I want to give you some space. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, historically, I attended several initiatives that were targeting women conductors since maybe like almost seven, eight years ago. So I think it was one of the first members who was um, the masterclass that Alice Farham Royal House, um, Royal Opera House. So like they organized the workshops for women conductors only and there were only 24 applications. You can imagine any free program with only 24 applications because people were skeptical. Why are you only inviting women conductors? Oh, and it was I like, see. it was amazing. So I talked to Alice and then she said her idea was to train more women becoming conductors at any level. So just like women physicians. So if you go to a doctor's office now, when you see a women doctor, you don't feel insecure like or you don't feel that the doctor won't treat you well because she is a woman so she felt it's a, a number thing and because of her background she was an organist she never thought she would be a conductor until that she had to let a church choir and then felt okay she needed to learn something about conducting and that seemed to be some well, common background or in experiment uh, ex oh, experience. So, but I, I was completely opposite. Like I would, I never felt that I couldn't do anything because I was a girl. And partly, I later found out but partly because I went to girls high school. So during the time, my formative times, I didn't have to compete with boys. I was just who I am um, as girls and we could do anything. That's the, like the model of our school is like, we can, we can run the country and run a family. That's how we train our girls in my high school. So, but anyways, in our, um, in the most ideal world, when we have all the money and all the people that we have, we want to have three different branches for girls who conduct for like the really young middle school or even like elementary school girls, just for them to have role models and to see that this is something that you can consider for your future. And we'll have like the emerging ones for people just getting out of class, uh, uh, trainings or like in applying for graduate stu studies and also for like the professional women to have some community. Um, we started this inaugural mentorship programs targeting girls between high school and college. So we have people just have no idea what conducting is and um, mm -hmm. they just wanted to know more to high to college senior who has who are thinking about applying for graduate programs who had maybe done some conducting regularly through their school program so we have a six week um, workshop we talk about from conducting to like Michelle said they're making they elect to be um, doing score study rehearsal strategy or programming ideas and then we talk about resumes um, building your career and how to send applications and every week because it's targeted to serve we talk about some gender issues that we all faced or might be facing we started talking about implicit bias for example and then we will be talking about confidence like traditionally girls and boys or our com comfort level and confidence level are a little different girls tend to apologize a little more when they don't feel they are following the rules, for example. Mm. Um, you see more girls conducting on the podium, they close, they, they say, oh, sorry, can we go back? Um, can we please go back to the beginning? You very rarely hear a guy say, sorry, we need to fix this. I'm sorry, can we do that? I'm sorry, can we make it softer here? But it's very natural because a lot of the women are trained to apologize first and also when you're on leadership positions when you start softer people tend to listen to you a little more they don't cut you off uh, quite as quickly um so those are that's very subtle things we talk about or like the body types how do you move your arms when you have something very different from your teachers you've only studied with male teachers um they have things that they don't understand like how you your clothes would not hang on the top of your body, for example. Yeah. <laughs> so like just all those 
very subtle things that we are discussing with our um, girls. And I'll just, I'll just add to that, that something that came up this past weekend, uh, at least in our breakout room, was also that if you do go forth with confidence, to be prepared for what that might mean because of implicit bias. So, you know, you may have that, that one very type A girl who's perfectly suited for the role and she'll, she'll encounter people who say you're being too abrasive as a, as a person on the podium. And so kind of preparing the girls to say, I mean, obviously you wanna make sure your manner is friendly, but being, you know, preparing them to say that, that um, you will encounter some backlash because of what the norm is right now. And, and we're trying to shift that. We're trying to say it is okay for you not to apologize and to just say measure 34, please. Um, there's a way to balance it and be, you know, genial, but also to have the confidence and not as Chow M was mentioning to, to shrink yourself to fit a certain mold. Um, so that's been a super interesting part of this already. Yeah, and I think that it's been a learning experience for us as a group. I think we, like it's, it's been a, a support group for ourselves and to rely on each other. And when we have questions about our careers, I, I know that I can count on Chao Wen or um, ask for advice about interviews, which I have one coming up. So she's been helping me. Uh, so I think that it's been a, a, a good, um, besides the support group, like I think it has taught us that we can rely on each other. And most of us didn't have that group while going through our careers. And it actually makes a huge difference. So I think that we're hoping that those girls can rely on each other too and create their own groups. Yeah, oh, interesting. I feel like I'd love to hear it from a female perspective, but as a male observer of the industry, I feel like the shock of a female conductor is no longer a thing. Uh, and I'm sure with, with some people it is, but I remember 20 years ago or even 10 or 15 years ago, when you heard about a woman getting a job in an orchestra, people say, oh, wow, a woman, a big deal of a woman. And now lately, like in the last three or four or five years, you see women conductors winning jobs all over the place, mostly assistant conductor jobs. You don't see a lot of music directors yet, but I feel like it's no longer a shock. It's not news when a woman wins a job anymore. Do you feel the same way? I personally think it largely it's very geographically based. So you see more in larger cities. Um, I still get that a lot when I work with more like local community ensembles. Or sometimes they put it this way. They say, oh, you're the first good women conductor that we've ever had. Mm. That kind of applying the other ones. Like, or um, I, I can speak from a male perspective because I've never been. So I, when people ask me, how do you feel it's different? I can't really tell if it's different, but I do feel that very often as a woman, you are not always given a second chance that is given to your other colleagues. Mm -hmm. So it's like they try you out and you can't. So they have, okay, but then it, it doesn't work or we had done something and it's okay to move on to pass. Um, if this didn't work, or a lot of the places still accept you, for example, as assistant, but not give the the real job because they want you on staff, or even I've I've been told by some workshop orchestras that they are okay to play under um, female conductor in workshops, but they would never select them um, to invite them back because they are just not good which is which is com um, controversial in a way because what people's perspective is good conductor is also biased in a way it has a lot to do with ex your expectation of what you think should be a good conductor so like Hannah said when someone says like just kind of business like let's go back to measure 34 that can be interpreted as very cold and um, business and bossy, or it can be professional, or he or he or she is doing as opposed to the same thing done by different people will be interpreted in different ways. So I would say we, I think, I personally think we still have a long way to go, even though like a lot of the changes, changes are obvious and welcoming. Yeah. Well, there's certainly more 
more work to be done um, just because of the, the numbers. I, I was looking at the guests I've had on my show and they're mostly men and they're mostly white and the women even are mostly white because that's who conductors are right now. But that's not representative of the population of the United States. And it's not the representative of the population anywhere else in the world for that matter. But, but, um, but I do feel like what you, you said, like oh, what a conductor is supposed to be like. And I think 50 years ago, a conductor was supposed to be a white man. And if somebody else who wasn't a white man said, I'm a conductor, you'd say, that's crazy. You couldn't be a conductor, but I don't think it's shocking anymore to see a woman conductor. And that's, that's, mo that's moving in the right direction. I think you hit upon a, a big point, Silas, where you said it's mostly assistantships at this point. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I don't want to be too negative, but I, I feel like at this point, a lot of people want to check a tick box, um, which has been a theme lately for lots of things, not just women, but, you know, BIPOC and, and all sorts of underrepresented groups. And so a lot of times, or even if it's not for a tick box, you'll see that the, the women candidates get hired as a fellow or as an assistant and but it, it's those trusting them to lead the ship positions mm -hmm. where you, you still don't see it too much and when you do it's really it's it's like a whole thing and so I think the end goal is to make it where it's no longer a thing but it's just another good musician leading another great ensemble or not so great ensemble um <laughs> but but at this point, at least in my experience, I'll, I'll let Chao and Michelle speak to theirs. It seems to me that there's still hesitance to let people actually be the director, the artistic director, and that it's always kind of the assistants and the fellows, unless it's a very, very rare case, um, which is crazy because you'll have plenty of women that are just as qualified as their male counterparts who are getting those jobs. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah, we haven't seen many announcements about women winning music directorships in recent years. I don't want to say any names on the show, but you know, very few. Um, but I do feel like, and in like a lot of the assistantships are going to young women. And twenty years from now, those young women will be the age that music directors typically get hired at, like in their forties and fifties. So I am anxious. I, I don't want to wait twenty years to see a big change, but I think in twenty years we can expect to see female music directors at major orchestras. I hope, I mean, more of them besides Marin Alsop and Joanne Falletta. Yeah, Who knows? I mean, I, I, uh, it can only go in that direction. And then there, there's also, uh, we're talking about a lot of gender stuff today, but there's also um, uh, ethnicity and underrepresented, um, uh, other upper underrepresented people. Uh, so it's curious that, that everybody in the business is talking about this, but orchestras still kind of look the same. I actually recently had a very famous conducting teacher complain to me that only his female students are getting jobs. And he felt very bad for his male students because they're equally competent, um, but they're not getting jobs because it's not as fancy. Hmm. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say either. <laughs> That's I mean, in theory, in theory, the uh, panel's search committees are hiring the best conductor, regardless of race or gender. Right? And, and in theory, more women are being trained better. And so the, the, the field should be uh, fairer. In reality, when I see applicants for workshops and applicants for jobs, they're usually about 80% male or, or 65 to 75% male. And that means that there's a 65 to 75% chance a male is going to win the job. All, all conductors being evenly talented, right? Um, I was just going to say that sounds, Chowen, like an equity versus equality conversation. Yeah, it's maybe. It's an echo of, of all of the, the racial stuff that we've been dealing with uh, for a long time. <laughs> so maybe just people are shocked when there's any kind of little change, even if it's not an equal playing field or an equitable playing field. Um, which is not not a good mindset. We should want to strive for that equity for sure. <laughs> what are what are things like in other countries? Like uh, Michelle, you said you're you're um, you're not American. I don't know if you're an American citizen, but you're not American by birth. So, what are orchestras like in South America, for example? Yeah, so Argentina, and that's the the place I was raised and born, and I can speak to that. Um, 
it's it's a very interesting culture it's very progressive in some aspects and then very conservative in others and concerning classical music it's still a little behind um i i personally didn't have good experiences with um some workshops and teachers that would tell me um i couldn't conduct certain repertoire because of being a woman or i was not taken seriously um and they thought that i was going to rehearsals or uh you know approaching them not because of conducting but other matters when i was just there for my career you know and so when i saw that that was happening and also I, i'm a young conductor and that's not a good thing in argentina especially if you're a woman you're not going to get as many opportunities i realized i needed to <laughs> get out of there you know and continue studying there were also no uh graduate programs offered for conducting so that's that was the main thing that pushed me to come to the USA and continue my studies and also I felt you know I had more opportunities here and it, although it would still be hard to be a woman it would be less <laughs> aggressive or not as a big of a, of a fact as I felt it was in Argentina so I think there's still a lot of progress to be made they're starting to get uh, women in some assistant conductor positions, which is a new huge thing, which has never happened. So that's the first step. But I do agree with everybody that at least here, now that I've graduated from my doctoral degree and I'm trying to enter the workforce, either professionally or in academia, I can tell that when you're starting to get to the higher levels of, of playing the game, right, I, I can tell that it's, it's harder to be a woman. And um, there are other considerations that you have to have in mind when interviewing, you know. So I do believe that change is coming. I do believe that the pandemic has forced everybody to see, to look at themselves and how they're relating to their communities and how they want to be represented in arts and cultures. So I do think a change is coming. It will take a few years, but, you know, I'll keep fighting. <laughs> Well, I think uh, Girls That Conduct is a good thing that you started in Chao Wen. And uh, who else is on the team? So we have Michelle Raffrano, who is our opera specialist, mm -hmm. and Caitlin Beauvais. He, she started conducting bands and now switching. I think it's Chaponet Ponik. Um, she's from original from Thailand. I think she was she was actually my student when I was at Eastman. Oh. Um, so she is now and yeah, she I think she is getting her degree at the Teachers College, but she's on the music ed panel. So we have people from all, almost all fields of conducting. Uh, yes. So it sounds like you hand selected uh, people that would had different specialties for that reason. No, it, it turned out to be that way. So oh, <laughs> I harassed, it. no, I harassed like over a, a hundred women conductors to fill out a survey when I was starting this. So I just, I just check social media and whoever looked like a woman with a baton, then I send them an email. I say, hey, <laughs> I'm connecting with women conductors. Um, and then several of them reach out and say, hey, did some So they kind of, it's a natural selection and this is who left and <laughs> believed in the same um, goal. And I'm really happy for this team. It's it's a dream. It's a wonderful team. I've worked with so many people and so many different teams and this is truly the best one. Well, good. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. And, um, and, we'll, and I'll put a link to Girls Who Conduct in the description of the show so everyone can find you pretty easily. But ladies, thanks so much for having coffee with me. Thank, Thank you. you.